Good afternoon, everyone. You're an awfully quiet crowd, but it's good to see a good crowd here. My name is Tom Laney. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. The McFarland Center sponsors and supports a variety of lectures, programs, conferences, special events that, uh, so that look at questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation across the disciplines of the college. Uh, you can learn more and see videos of our programs at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. And in a few days, you can tell your friends about uh, this particular one. So this is being recorded and will be available in a couple of days. One of the programs that we coordinate through the McFarland Center with uh, Professor Mari Leonard Fleckman, who's here, and Professor Alan Avery Peck, is the Kraft Hyatt Fund for Jewish Christian Understanding. Uh, through lectures like today's, as well as opportunities for visiting scholars, faculty engagement, and study abroad scholarships for students, we deepen understanding of Judaism, Jewish life around the world, Jewish history, and Jewish Christian relations. Given the increasing incidence of anti-Semitism and the pervasiveness across pop culture and social media, I think building our capacity for mutual understanding is really crucial. So I'm grateful to uh, Professor Mari Leonard Fleckman, who coordinates the Hebrew Bible Lecture Series, for connecting us today with Ido Koch, He's trying to get me to say it in a good Israeli way that I'm, I'm failing at. So Ido Koch, uh, who is uh, here to speak with us today. Uh, today's lecture on archaeology and the study of uprooted communities in Israel. Dr. Koch is a senior lecturer in the Department of Archaeology in Ancient and Near Eastern Cultures at Tel Aviv University in Israel and coordinator, co-director of the Tel Hadid Expedition a site on a hill overlooking Tel Aviv metropolitan area. Previous excavations there have unearthed evidence of dislocated communities from the first half of the seventh century BCE, which can help inform us about the for how forced migration affects communities on the margins. Professor Leonard Fleckman and Dr. Koch are hoping to offer a Maymester course uh, for Holy Cross students at Tel Hadid in 2024, so mark your calendars now. Uh, look for details to come. Uh, Ido studies archaeology of Bronze and Iron Ages, Southern Levant, with a focus on colonialism, visual culture, and crafts. He's coordinator of a project on stamp seals from the Southern Levant, which aims to develop an online, open access, collaborative, and expandable database of the artifacts as a sustainable reference tool for future research in several disciplines. He recently published a book, first in Hebrew and then in English, Colonial Encounters in Southwest Canaan during the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age, and I won't attempt to say that in Hebrew, so uh, nobody tried to help me with that. And he's penned dozens of journal articles and book chapters, so please join me in welcoming Ido Koch. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be here, and thank you for the lovely introduction and I'd like to thank Mari for the kind invitation to be here. Um, so my name is Ido, and I teach archaeology, mostly archaeology of the society in the Southern Levant. I have biblical studies background and archaeology, and I deal mostly with material remains, so pottery fra uh, fragments and stone tools. Um, and during my PhD that started focusing on a specific region in Israel during the biblical period, and found myself more and more interested with a period that the people living there were under colonial rule by the Egyptians. Um, so Ramesses II, the great Ramesses, was ruling this region. And I found myself intrigued by the fact that in literature, you don't read about their experience, about how they experienced 400 years of colonialism. And that made me be more and more interested with colonial rule, with migrations, with forced migrations, and how we can study the experience of being a migrant or being under colonial rule from the archaeological data, so from the material record with no texts, because usually the subjugated people did not write their own texts. And this brought me to deal with the site that Tom mentioned, Tel Hadid, that I'm co-directing the expedition there, and I'll talk today about that site and what we can do with the remains from Tel Hadid. I decided um, when Mar and I spoke about the possible topic of my talk 
to talk about this subject of uprooted communities. Um, this is the reason that I started to work in Tel Hadid and we started a project there. And as you can see, it also forced me, not forced me, but encouraged me to go through different lines that I did not expect. So I started my studies in biblical studies and then archaeology. My PhD was about the late second, early first millennia in the Southern Levant. And nowadays I deal with 1948 C. And this is the journey we're going to do today in the coming half an hour, starting with first millennium BCE, finishing in 1948 C. So this is the one. And the scope to talk about this subject and to understand where I'm coming from is to talk with you about migrations. We are all migrants, or children, or grandchildren of migrants, at least in Israel. Um, these are my grandparents, Joseph and Deborah, just a year after they met. They met in Austria, um, in a refugee camp after the war, and they fell in love. They got married in Italy and moved to Palestine in November 1940. Seven. So this was taken just a few months before moving. Um, and my grandmother didn't know she's pregnant when this photo was taken. And they go, went on a boat from Italy to Palestine. They reached Palestine, but they were arrested by the British Navy. And they were sent to Cyprus in a refugee camp in Cyprus, waiting to get a visa to go to Palestine. And this is where my grandmother gave birth. My uncle was born there. And since she had a baby, they were allowed to go to Palestine. And there is a photo that I couldn't reach of them on the boat with this metal basin and a baby inside. And this ship was the ship for young parents with babies. So everybody there was this migrant. But my family started from this refugee experience. And we are analyzing, my parents and I, how they were educated by their parents that were refugees and how I might got probably some of these leftovers. And so in Israel, you'll get a lot of this interest with migrations and people that are trying to understand their past through the migration experience or the forced migration. And this leads me to the fact that in, across the world, mostly in, this, in the academy, not only there, you hear more and more of scholars interested about migrations, trying to get more insights from the study of migration since the refugee crisis in Europe in 2015, in America, with the southern border of the states and how it affects society. So my colleagues talk more about migrations in the study of migrations of in ancient societies, nowadays, even to the place of an archeological study of a refugee camp in Greece. It was a refugee camp for refugees from Syria, and then it was analyzed by a scholar from Brown University, how it looks like, archeology span of refugees nowadays. Um, Studying migrations mean that you should go into a place to ask what it does it feel to be forced to leave your home. Most migrations are forced migrations. It's either it's looking for a new job, a new opportunity, um, some new chances in your life. But, and I spoke about it with Mari yesterday, that in biblical studies you do have a constant um, discourse on the experience of being uprooted, mostly because of the destruction of the first temple and the, and the exile in Babylonia, because of the destruction of the second temple and the exile, and this diaspora discussion and the exile and being deported. So you have it in biblical studies, but it was never so intense as in the past five years or seven years even. And archaeology and Bible, Hebrew Bible, go together. And you start to see how one field 
influences the other. And when studying forced migrations, deportations, being exiled, the Hebrew Bible stands as the only evidence of the subjugated side, of what is the experience. How does it feel like when your home is being destroyed, when you are taken falsely from your home and forced to march for weeks or months to somewhere else? And then you need to start and build a new home. You need to recreate yourself. You need to explain yourself what happened to God if the temple is destroyed. And this was a unique development in the, for any other community that was deported to Mesopotamia, to Babylonia. They all disappeared after four, five generations, and the only community that stayed, that survived, was the Judahite, becoming, becoming Jews eventually. But this um, experience of being deported, of being exiled, was, you can explain better than me about that, but it's a formative one that you can, you can read in the Hebrew Bible. But what we are going to talk about in the coming half an hour, that this was the experience of millions in the ancient world. And we don't hear about them from their side. And this is why archaeology helps, because it can give voice to these people, to these uprooted communities. So we'll start with 15 minutes about the first phase. And this is the case of uprooted communities in the first millennium BCE. The Babylonians did not invent any, anything when they exiled the Judahites, the people from Jerusalem. They learned it better from the Assyrian Empire. Have you heard about the Assyrian Empire? Good, so it will be a brief introduction to the Assyrian Empire, and then we'll move to talk about how does it look like, archaeology of these communities that were exiled, were deported, through the finds found at Tel Hadid. And this leads our study at Tel Hadid in the past five years. And then we'll stay in Tel Hadid, but we'll move to the 20th century, to our state of Israel, and how we are studying Another case of uprooted community, this time a community of Palestinians that lived in Hadid until 1948. And we are going, we started studying the remains of their village. But in this case, we can talk with them. And this is what we do in the, in the last month. We interview refugees and they inform us what they want us to do as well. How can we explore their experience better with their information? So we'll start with Assyria and the Assyrian conquest of the Southern Levant and the deportation policy. And since you are familiar with the subject, I'll do it quickly that we talk about this part of the globe, Southwest Asia, also known as the Middle East. I don't like the term Middle East, so Southwest Asia. And the framework, the historical framework is the kingdoms, polities that existed in the, on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean that developed in the early first millennium. The, as long as we can judge, this is the first phase of non-colonial rule over Palestine, over the southern Levant. Um, the first one was by the Egyptian empire that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. Then you had the Assyrian empire, and since then it lasted until the 20th century C. So this is a, a, um, a window of opportunity for the local societies in the Southern Levant to develop their own political systems, a uh, system. And this is the context to understand the Kingdom of Israel. It's this one. And Judah, and Damascus, and Hamat. These are local polities that develop their own culture. And then came the Assyrians. It's not the first empire in the history of Southwest Asia. I mentioned the Egyptians, there were other empires as well, but the Assyrians were probably the most successful ones because their colonial means, their imperialist, imperialistic ideology, and what they did was to eradicate the Levantine landscape. The kingdoms that developed were completely eradicated by the Assyrians, and they did it by 
a removal of the local kings, the local rulers, and the establishment of provinces. Nobody did it before them. And they created this sophisticated system of once the battle is over, once the war is done, they send officials with soldiers. And they came to your village and counted how many people you are. How many sheep do you have? How many goats? How many cows? OK, thank you, bye bye. And after a week or two, they came back, this time with more soldiers. And they told you, OK, it's time to go. You had no idea where to. You had no idea how long it will take. And this is how they emptied the entire southern Levant from about one million people living there. So they went into capitals. They usually did not destroy capitals. They cleaned everything and installed their governors there. But they took, this is an image of Tiglat Pileser III, the king that actually established the empire after conquering a town. And you see these people living. Now, they are never mistreated. It's not death marches. They are being protected, guarded, and also led by the soldiers. They got provisions, they got food, shelter, clothes. But still, they were forced to leave their home. And this ensured the success of the Assyrian Empire. When they deported not only the king, but the entire elite, the entire urban population of a kingdom, there was no one to encourage revolts anymore. Rural population does not revolt. And indeed, there are no revolts documented in the southern Levant from the Assyrian conquest almost all the way to the Macedonian conquest of Alexander the Great. So four centuries with almost no rebellions in the places that, were, that turned into provinces. So whenever they would succeed in removing the king and the elite and taking their people with them, the whole Levantine landscape accepted the empire. It even became part of their ideology, of their religion, of the Levantine society that survived. And by that, the Assyrian empire were able to build an empire and to make it stable with no opposition. The people that were deported were sent mostly to the capitals. Assyria had three capitals, capital cities, and they became huge, something like half a million people in the biggest one, Nineveh, where the Iraqi city of Mosul is now located. None of them was Assyrian. They were all deportees from the Levant, from Babylonia, from Turkey, from Egypt, but they got an opportunity, if you agree, to become a Syrian, you'll be a Syrian. You simply need to say yes. And that's it. So they, for, in their mind, it was a resettlement policy. They gave them an option. Come with us and you'll have a much better life. They became Assyrians. They became citizens of the empire by relocating. Now look at this relief documenting the conquest of a Babylonian city, approximately the same time. And you can see the officials counting, making lists of what can be taken. And you can see families living on the cards. You can see them with kids. They are not mistreated. And this is important to understand. The Assyrian kings were happy to show how bad they were to enemies either in, cruci in crucifying them, in decapitating them, massacring people. But the deportees are always well taken care of by the Assyrian um, army. And they were, you can see this, um, mourning women for the defeat of their city, the death of the people. But the Assyrians, again, presented it as a new opportunity. They were spread, so they were not settled in one community of people from Israel, for example. But they were spread in cities and in the 
we will hinterland. Or, if you misbehaved, you were sent to a gulag, to a camp in the Iranian plateau or in Anatolia, or to the southern Levant, which was the middle of nowhere in the Assyrian perspective. It was in the margins. But this helped them to support their army, to support the military that were protecting the borders. The only concept that is a constant is that you will be deported to the farthest end of the empire. So if you were taken from the southern Levant, you'll be settled in Babylonia, which is the eastern edge of the empire. If you are from Babylonia, you'll be sent to the southern Levant. And these are the people we are going to talk about in a few minutes. The thing to understand, and this is what we learned from ethnographic studies, but also from the Hebrew Bible, is that being deported, being exiled, is a dislocating experience. Think of the people that came from Babylonia. Do you know how to imagine modern Iraq? Big rivers, floodplains, beautiful plants, no rain at all, there's no rainfall in this part of the globe. They were in the center of the universe. The Babylonian cities were magnificent. They were huge, with monumental temples and libraries. And they were sent to the middle of nowhere called Palestine, Israel nowadays, in the southern Levant, when there is no river, there is rain, weird plants. Language is different than what they are familiar with. And they had to, re again, reinvent themselves. So this dislocating, disorienting experience is something that we must appreciate when we try to understand the experience, but even more important to understand that we are talking about millions of people that were deported by the Assyrian Empire. According to conservative estimate by a professor in the University of Munich, Munich, her name is Karen Radner, something like four million people were moving by the Assyrian Empire as part of the restructuring of the society in the empire. This is a huge number of people traveling in 100 years across the empire. And this is while, again, experiencing the death of thousands of people, the destruction of your house, the destruction of your temple. The gods were taken captives by the Assyrians to their capital, Ashur. And then you need to understand how to start your life again. And as I mentioned, the entire society was altered, transformed, changed completely. And you found yourself in a new place with new people that you didn't know. And you have to start something else. And this is where archaeology comes into the fore. There is no archaeological study of these deportees at all. I mean, when archaeologists dig in a site and they found remains from this period, they analyzed that. But it was never analyzed under this framework of migration studies and mostly forced migration studies. And this is what we do in our project. And I would like to exemplify that with a few case studies. We'll start with what was the capital of Israel, Samaria and then we'll move to our region of Hadid and Gezer next to what is now Tel Aviv metropolitan area. And I focus on Israel not only because it's my home country, but also because it's the most explored, archaeologically explored region in the world. In this little part of the Levant, we are familiar with more than 25,000 archaeological sites. This is a huge number, and the development of Israel nowadays, the infrastructure, and the fact that we have a strong department of antiquities means that we have an accumulating archaeological data to deal with. Every year, we have more and more information that we can analyze. So this is why it's the most productive place to do this kind of analysis of the deportees. According to the Assyrian sources, thousands of people were deported from Israel. You can see the numbers here. 
something like one quarter of the population of the kingdom was deported. Probably the same number was killed during the wars or fled as refugees somewhere else. And also from an archaeological point of view, we see that complete regions were emptied from their population for centuries. But some places were rebuilt by the empire to serve their needs. And we'll talk about, as I mentioned, Samaria and Hadid and Gezer. One of the more famous um, depictions of deportees are these guys that were deported from the city of Lachish, Lachish, in the kingdom of Judah. So this is a close-up of the same similar scene that I showed you earlier of the deportees. And look at what we see and imagine what could they carry with them. So they have to live now. They don't know for how long and where to. And they can carry with them only what can be carried on their shoulders or if they have this cart on the cart with the donkey. What would you carry with you? Is it the most personal belongings, like something you got from your grandmother? Is it something that will help you to sustain your life on the journey? Is it extra clothes, more food? We don't know from this evidence, clearly. But we know that it poses a problem in archaeological research. We don't know what to look for. The way we know about deportees in the Southern Levant in the late 8th and early 7th centuries BC mainly comes from written sources, from inscribed objects, where we hear their names. So we start with Samaria that was rebuilt, resettled by the Assyrians and became an, a capital of the province of Samaria. And it lasted like that until the Macedonian conquest, until the time of Alexander the Great. It remained the capital of this province. And as a good capital of a province, we have inscribed objects, including a seal of the king himself that was found there, this one. You see him fighting and defeating a lion. There is a royal inscription there, a stele placed by Sargon II, one of the greatest kings of the empire. And there are other documents of daily mundane things. Someone buys a property, and there are witnesses to this um, contract. And then is, this is the place when we hear about the people themselves, not about the king, but about the people. And this is when, where we hear about people with foreign names, Babylonian names, Aramaic names, and they are trying to live their life as they are used to, from home, but now in this new place. There are also pieces of evidence that relate to behavior, and this is important. Since they cannot carry much with them, we can identify them best on their behavior. This is a local type of a bowl, known across Palestine and Israel for several, almost two centuries in the first millennium BC. But someone used a kind of a stick, and you see they created these triangular shape holes to make a bowl to be a kind of a grinder. So there was even an experiment using kind of potato, and you can grind the vegetable with this um, vessel. And why it's important? Because this type of vessels are known from Babylonia exactly at the same time, and centuries before. So it's an idea that was brought from Babylonia and done for the deportees here, there in Palestine. So it's someone went to a potter, a local potter, and told them, take this bowl, but I would like to make these holes so they can use it to prepare food, food that will remind them home by the taste or the smell or the texture. And this is one of the most prominent aspects of migrant communities, 
having food that reminds them of home. So this is the most mundane vessel you can think of, no inscriptions, but it shows that these people still wanted to feel somehow at home in this new place by making their own food. We are moving to Hadid, the side that we like a lot. And this is where, Mari, you walked at the upper part of the site. And what brought me in to deal with Hadid are inscriptions. During the 1990s, there were excavations there, founding this clay tablet. It's not more than four inches tall, even less. You can see the scale here. And it's inscribed with cuneiform text. Someone sold a field to someone else. There are five witnesses attesting to the, uh, or approving the contract. And all of the names are either Babylonians or Aramaic. And there is a date. We can precisely date it to the spring of, of 697 or 98 BC. Even the date, the exact day in that month. Another tablet was found at a on the floor of a house, this time alone. Someone loans money to someone else, and if the someone else will not return it, the money, his wife and sister will become slaves for three years. Good patriarchal society of the Levant. But once again, we have the date, and there are the names, Babylonian, Aramaic, and local names. The two women are local, meaning that also the one that got the loan is local. This joined two other tablets from the same region, the site of Gezer, just south of Hadid. Again, two tablets, land sale contract between someone selling the property to someone else with witnesses, and you can see the list of names. The one who buys the property in one of these tablets, his name was Netanyahu, like our beloved prime minister. And this is interesting because this time we are talking about 649 or 48 BC. So something like 60 years since the deportation, since the exile of these Babylonians to what is now Palestine. So who was Netanyahu? Is he another local guy that goes into business with one of the deportees? Or could it be a member of the deportee community that his parents gave him a local name to be more mingled with the local society? We know this situation from most migrant communities you can think of. We hear about it also in the Hebrew Bible. Jews in Babylonia got Babylonian names like Esther and Mordechai. So could Netanyahu be a local or another deportee that his parents gave him a local name? We can say that his, the seal he was using was with a Syrian symbol of the moon crescent, of the moon god. It's all complex. We'll not be able to give a definite answer, but at least we should be aware of the possibility. What we are sure is that what we have here is a mixed community of locals and deportees that had to live together, had to interact under the empire. And this is another dimension of complexity because what we see is that the tablets in Gezer and in Hadid were found in houses built in local style. They were found next to vessels made in local way, local traditions. So we would not be talking here today about deportees if we had no inscriptions mentioning their names. And this is a big dif difficulty for archaeologists. We tend to identify people by their material remains, by their vessels, by the way they build their houses. And here we don't have this option. So we still need to find a way to do it. We don't find inscriptions every day. We don't find inscriptions at all. We need to find a way to find them. And hence what we are doing in our project is to identify them by their behavior, as I mentioned. They couldn't carry much with them. They had to use a house built in local way. They had to use vessels produced by local potters. 
What we can check is how they used the houses. My house and probably most of your houses look quite the same. We have a kitchen, we have a living room, bedroom. We have similar organization of the house. It's not the same for people living in Japan, for example. It's a different concept of a house, or for sure not in other places of the world. Back then, houses were completely different between regions of the same country. Southern Levant knows about at least four different ways to organize a house at the same period. So think about people living something like 1,000 miles away with their own traditions. So they moved in to a house that is not built according to how they are used to, but maybe we can find a way they reorganize it with their vessels. We'll find a different, hopes free, a different usage of the house. So we can identify burial practices, new ones. Here you see a jar made in local style, covered with a bowl made in local style, that contained the remains of an adult person that was cremated. And this is not a local way of burying the dead. So this is something that came from the outside. The same goes with other objects like this amazingly beautiful seal. This one on the hand of Leanne, a student from New Orleans that found it. And when I got the walkie talkie message by the supervisor of the area, her name is Alex. And she told me we found a seal and it's made of mother of pearl. So I told her, you know nothing, Jon Snow, there are no seals made of mother of pearl. And I was wrong. It is unique, one of a kind. There is no such thing anywhere in the Southern Levant made of this material. And you can see on this map where you can find mother of pearl. And it's not in the Mediterranean where our site is located. So what we assume is that we have an indication of someone using seals with material that either came from here or here, but not a local one. And this is exciting to be able to show that people did perhaps carry their personal belongings from where they were deported from. And this might be able, based on the iconography, we are going to publish it hopefully next year, based on the iconography incised on the seal that we con connect it to a specific city in Babylonia. But this will wait until the final publication. There are many more questions that we hope to answer. And you can see the list, you can think of so many other questions if you think about migrant communities and how they are eventually able to find a way in a new place. How they became respected members of the society. We hear about their descendants a few centuries later. In the Persian period, they are rulers of Samaria, one family of this Babylonian origin uh, um, community members. So we are not sure if we can sp spot now what was the character of the interaction between them and the locals. How long it took them to, became, to become locals, and they did eventually. But we are in a hope that we'll be able to do so in the future. Questions are at the end, right? We are living the 7th century now, BC, and moving to the 20th century C. That was weird. But if you have any question, please let me know. So I came to Hadid to study the biblical period, 7th century, 8th century, BC, the Iron Age. But as you walk through the site, you see beautiful hundreds of olive trees in nice plots with cacti fences bordering, fencing them. You can see ruins of houses. And when you walk up to the hill to see the area where Mari and the other guys were walking in 2019, you actually stand on top of a cemetery. So you are all over the place surrounded by an uprooted community. And we, it was a long process for myself, a very reflective one, that we decided to start a project in studying this community, the modern community that lived at the site 
until 1948. So this is a new project that we started last month, and um, this is what I'm going to present now. So we moved 2,700 years to the future, but it's a very promising one, and I'm very excited that we got the funding to do so. We are in 1948, actually more specifically 1947 to 49, but we call it 1948 war, the war of independence for the state of Israel. And the first phase of the war was very bad for the Jewish uh, community in Palestine. There was, it was a kind of a civil war between each village and each town had clashes. And in 1948, five Arab armies invaded Palestine. The Jordanians, for example, took over the West Bank and became the occupiers of the West Bank until 1967. But this horrible war that lasted for a year and a half eventually ended with the victory of Israel and Jordan and the horrible loss of the Palestinian community in Palestine. Like any civil war, and this was a very tough civil war, people were uprooted. So the Jews had to leave Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. Thousands of Jews had to leave and were able to return only with the conquest of Jerusalem in 1967. But even more traumatic and tragic until now is that something like half a million Palestinians had to leave their homes. In hundreds of villages and towns, um, some of them fled before the Jewish army arrived. Some of them were expelled by the um, um, Jewish armies. And this is probably the most important, crucial element in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict until nowadays. This is the only reason no, the peace was not signed in 2000 between Israel and the, and the PLO and the Palestinian Authority, because Israel refuses to let refugees coming back to what is now the state of Israel. And the half a million back then are now something like three, four million people, and they want to go back. And this is exactly the case of the village that used to be at Hadid. This was the name, Al Hadita, and you can see this photo. We don't have many photos of the village, but this is one of them. And it was taken only because of this mosaic floor was found in 1940. So the archaeologists took this photo. We don't have too many images of the village, but I decided not to escape from that. You cannot ignore a stratum, a, 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 a phase in the occupation of a site. You can do it, but then you're a bad archaeologist, in my opinion. You have a responsibility, we, I have a responsibility to treat the site as a whole and not to be selective in the periods that I like the most. And important even more, not to, not to run away from this political issue. And it is a political issue. Uh, my grandfather, when they moved to Palestine in 1947, was recruited to the Jewish militia that became the IDF. And he also conquered villages in the north, not this one. And he was proud of it. And it took me some time to understand that I can recognize the other side's experience. I don't need to identify with them. I'm still coming from my background, but at least be able to give them the place and to allow them to present their narrative of the story. So I invited a colleague from the Department of Middle Eastern Studies. Let's apply for funding to study the village. And we were refused for four years in German funds, in European funds, in Israeli funds. And this July, we got a yes from the Israel Science Fund, so from the Israeli government, to study the village of Al-Khadita. And this will be a combination of archaeological excavation, historical analysis of archive documents, of aerial photos, of maps, of any source we can find, and interviews with the refugees. And as of yesterday, we have five interviews with refugees. They are all happy to collaborate. They hope that we will be able to give them 
the stage to present their story. And we decided also to ask them, do you want us to excavate in a specific place? And do you um, object us to excavate in this or that place? So they cannot join the dig, but they can lead me in questions and help me to decide what to do. We also decided to publish the reports and the books in three languages, in Arabic, English, and Hebrew. So it will be available to all communities. And we hope to also upload everything to be an, an, an open access database. And yes, people ask me if I do it because of political reasons, because of, I don't know. And I guess I am. But I also think that we have an opportunity to present a new methodology, a new way to deal with the many most recent past of our country by doing good archaeology, good historical analysis, and to give these people the option to present their experience of being uprooted. And I'm very happy we do it, I have to admit. I'm, I, I was skeptical, and we got the money, and now we do it. And it's give some optimism um, to what we can do in our field. So I would like to thank you for your attention. You're most welcome to join us this summer, and hopefully the next summer. But thank you so much for the attention. <laughs> this is the top of the mound, and all of this, you see these little green hips? These are all ruins of the village, of houses of the village, that we can, based on this photo, identify the houses that are ruined, but now we can say where each of them is located. And this is an artificial podium built during the probably first century BCE as part of a fortress that used to be there. And this is the cemetery of the village that I mentioned earlier. But these are all olive trees that belong to the, to the village. And these are all terraces that was, were built by the village people. And we are now able to say which tree belonged to which family. And we also got from them information about when they were planted and this kind of stuff. Please. The village itself? Yeah. How does it, how was it to live in a village in 1940, until 1948 in Palestine? What was their economy based on? Not what was recorded by the British Mandate authorities, but what can we learn about their diet and hygiene conditions? What can we learn about the um, animal exploitation practices? What age did they butcher their sheep or goat or cows? Um, we want to explore when was it founded? The site appears, the name appears on European maps in the 17th century. It does not appear in the Turkish, in the Ottoman Turkish um, documents from the 15th, uh, 16th century. So it appears all of a sudden in European maps, but we have no remains of this period yet. So we want to understand that. We want to understand um, its um, expansion, how the, the the settlement developed. And to get some insights about their economic abilities, not only about what they grew and what they ate, but also whether they were able to buy European commodities in the 19th century. There are beautiful studies of the European communities. Next to Hadid, there is a ruined village that used to be a German um, colony. There are six German colonies in Palestine. There were six colonies. They were all exiled in the beginning of the Second World War. Um, and they brought with them their pottery, their ceramics from the Rhine Valley. So you see these Viroy and Bosch products in these places. And very few of them were marketed to neighboring villages. So we want to be able to identify that as well. Yes, please. Olive tree, great question. Um, you produce olive oil and there were big plants of olive oil production in Lida, the main town nearby. I showed a photo of these people leaving the refugees, Palestinian refugees. This is when they left Lida. And 
there were four families producing olive oil in Lida, and all of the villages supplied them with the olives for that. Um, yes. Yes, please. What opportunities are there for students to join your day? <laughs> well, to have fun, but also to um, learn how we make our conclusions. Um, so I date this deportee community to a specific date, and you'll be able to learn how we do it, and how we excavate, why we excavate, um, and this is for the first time. There is a field school, we teach field archaeology in the field, but also in class. There are introduction to archaeology, to history of the country, and we'll develop already a program of tours and classes about Israeli society nowadays. So one important thing is not to be, to come to Israel and learn only about Israelite society or the, or the deportees, but let's talk about Israeli society. And the fact that we are going to dig a Palestinian village requires some components about getting to know the Israeli politics a bit and the Palestinian Israelis that are about one-fifth of the population. We are staying in a place called Neve Shalom, Oasis of Peace in English, that was founded by a monastery. Um, you remember the domination of the Latrun? Mm -hmm. And it's, the, it's a village of 900 people, 300 Jews, 300 Christians, 300 Muslims. And they have this dialogue between them. And this year was the first time that we joined the dialogue. So we got some talks by people of the village. If you come to the second year, you have the option of becoming staff. Um, so you'll be square supervisor, and then you can be assistant area supervisor. Um, one of our area supervisors, she's doing her PhD at Tel Aviv, and she started as a um, team member in 2012 in another project. And she joined the next year and the next year, the year after, and be she became a second in chief of the project. Um, another one is joined our project in Jerusalem many years ago, and now she's the field director of one of the biggest projects in Tel Aviv. So it's, do you want to? You can just go, you can like just Google the Tel Aviv project and just sign on for the summer and go. But we're also trying to start a new semester that would hopefully start not this summer, but the fall and stuff. The students can go to, they can get credit for. I'm a senior, but I'm yeah. considering looking for a field school as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, we're also trying to get some funding for scholarships. It's not, it's expensive, an archaeological dig. I don't know if you can appreciate how much a, a season costs, but it's a lot of money and we're trying to get funding to help students to join us as well. Um, and it's fun. It's really, once you, I mean, I started, I told you, as a biblical study student for my MA studies in Tel Aviv. And then I was invited by my professor to join his dig. And I didn't know what to expect. And I got um, possessed by archeology. span Addicted, I, it's, you cannot explain it when you get into routine of the four weeks of waking up early in the morning, but having this, you, we dig in the sand, but eventually we find stuff and we ask questions about why we do things like that. And we are exploring a lot about ourselves as well in doing this um, field work. Do you want to add anything of your experience? Just that it's very different than looking at texts. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and the, the landscape that people have lived in and breathed in and occupied. So it feels very, very different. It makes things come to life in a totally different way than text. Mm -hmm. It's like seeing reception history. It makes things come to life. Like reading a novel about David, for example. Yeah. 
so they were pushed, they were called by the Jordanian Legion, it was the Jordanian army, to find shelter in a nearby village, but most of them decided to stay despite the warning. And then when the village was conquered by the Jewish forces, they were expelled to um, a place in the West Bank now called Budrus. You can see it actually in the back side of the photo over there where the trees are. And nowadays they are mostly in Ramallah, um, the capital of the Palestinian Authority now, and in Amman in Jordan. There were five families, six families. Four of them are in Ramallah, two of them are in Amman. Um, Oh yes, a family means a whole, yeah, it's more than 100 people, a family. Um, it, the village was something like 800 people in July 48 when it was conquered. So it's not a small, but not the largest village you can think of. And they have, and this is how we were able to communicate with them, they have even Facebook groups. Uh, it's uh, the Jama, the um, association of Haditha, in Ramallah and in Jordan, um, it was easy for us to contact the guys in Ramallah. And we had a lovely Zoom meeting with the head of the, f of the association and through him we got co the contact with the five other guys. Um, they used to, until the second intifada, until 2001, they used to, to go and take care of the olives and they are YouTube, if you YouTube, You'll start, you'll see one of the older women of them talking about where was their house. And so we, again, I'm very grateful that they agreed to join us and they agreed to collaborate. It's not easy, I guess, for them. And still they do it. And I'm very grateful. Yes, please. Um, there was an uprising in 2001 in Israel and in the occupied territories. Uh, that lasted for, in Israel only for two weeks, but it was a deadly one. And in the West Bank and Gaza, it lasted for three years. And it was a horrible period in Israel and in the occupied territory, it was absolutely horrible. With um, suicide attacks and bombings and buses exploding. And as part of the, the way the Israeli government took care of the situation, it, they built a wall. Uh, around the West Bank. Um, and then there are no terrorist attacks anymore. Th still, they might be, but it's much less. But it also means that they give less uh, visas to people to come to Israel. So this is why they cannot uh, go to Hadid anymore. Um, but we are trying to get them the approval now to visit with us at the site. Thank you for asking. Yes, please. So, you said that you uh, talked to them about places that they would meet more people of like exodus. Were there any places that they specifically considered being more like exodus? Tombs, burials. And as I mentioned, the white part over there on the left is the, ce is the older cemetery. Um, and we accidentally excavated two burials there. Accidentally, because we didn't know it's there. It was on the slope and beyond the limits of the cemetery, and it was two burials probably from 600 years ago, or even more. But still, it, they, for them, it's part of their heritage. It's part of their family. And um, um, there is no, I mean, there is a law. According to the Israel antiquity law, human remains are not archaeology. They belong to the religious authorities. Um, so whenever we encounter human remains, we must call this ultra-Orthodox guys. We don't, but we, this is the law. Um, and some of my colleagues find it hard to understand why we should not hear the feeling of these people. And then I sent them the federal law passed 10 years ago in the States about that you are not allowed to excavate human remains unless you get the approval of the community. Um, and I highly respect that. I don't want, I mean, I don't care about myself, but I don't want anybody to excavate my grandmother, for example. So this is why, this is the only request we got thus far from them. So you see this house, this big building? 
You can see it also here. And this was one of the central buildings of the village for communal gathering and for um, meals and in, in festivals. So this is something they wanted us to do. And this was their school, but it was built in the 20s, 1920s, out of concrete. So we don't want to excavate concrete. Um, but these are the two requests that we got thus far. Ah, it's recent, so there will be almost no um, remains, um, all the remains. We know it was built in 1923, when the British men, they decided to build schools in all of the villages in Palestine. And we don't, there is nothing for us to study from there, about the village, almost, because it was empty spaces with some benches where they taught the classes. We'll get much more information if we excavate the communal gathering house over there. Yes, please. So in what sense, I want to know, what does it mean? Why excavate a place where you have living people who can tell you about it? It seems to me you have a story that if you, the ancient village, you don't have, you maybe got a few tablets. Mm -hmm. So you're telling a story out of what you can find physically. But here you've got people who can tell you what was where, what was going on. So what's, tell me the added value. What we learned from contemporary archaeology that has been conducted in Normandy, for example, the battlefield of the Second World War, in the Amsterdam landfill, even Los Angeles landfill, is that you learn so much about communities that they don't tell you about. Do you know this study of the landfill of Los Angeles? It started earlier with the study of garbage bins in a, in a neighborhood in Los Angeles. Asking them, what do you think you will find in your garbage bin? And they said everything but alcohol, porn magazines, and I think there was another, a third category of objects that they didn't, none of them said that, that you would find. This is anecdote. The basic is that you get much information that is not documented and usually is not memorized. Um, and already now we have conflicting memories about the village by two of the refugees. They are above 80. Time has passed, they were very young when they left the village, so it's fragile and partial. And we hope to fill in the gaps with the archaeological excavation. And especially to understand the development of the village. We have no idea, again, when it was founded. The earliest evidence is from, um, in archive notes, is from the mid-19th century. We want to go further back in time. And again, how they lived. We have no idea, and they don't tell us. So yes, they had one hectare of olive trees, but that's it. We have no idea about their food, their diet. So hopefully we'll get some information. I can say about the sister kingdom of Judah that was completely changed because of the Assyrian occupation with their ideology, with their visual uh, language, so they gradually abandoned all of the previous um, religious symbols and adopted new ones that were influenced by the Assyrian um, iconography, mostly royal iconography. You can see new modifications of the organization of the houses. You can see new changes in the economy. Language was gradually changing and becoming Aramaic, not Hebrew than before. Um, so this is for uh, Judah, but also the social structure has changed. Because one thing empires do is that they go underneath the hegemony of the rulers, of the local rulers, and try to find new centers of powers to collaborate with them against the king. And this is also something we see in Judah, that local elites became more important on the expense of the king. Um, in, uh, you can see influx of new spices of luxury commodities, like perfumes. Um, what else? Migrants. There are inscriptions in Southern Arabian dialects in Jerusalem during this time. So people that came from what is now the Yemen and stayed in Jerusalem, even probably lived there. Um, 
Yeah. This is why I'm interested in colonialism. They simply change societies. And you can learn so much about how political power alters the social la landscape by this hegemony or domination. But thank you for the question. Thank you for such a great presentation. Such good images, inspiring. Thank you. Appreciate it. it was my pleasure.